Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people. Today, we are going to examine the birth of Spanish America. We will look at Spanish conquests leading up to and after the discovery by Europeans of the New World. We will look at the role of religion in Spanish America. And then finally, we will examine the economy and government in Spanish America within the Spanish Empire. We last left off with the death of Napoleon. The French Revolution and Napoleon are going to have very long-lasting and far-reaching effects. What occurs in France from the late 1700s to the early 1800s is going to spread. It's going to cross an ocean. It's going to directly affect what happens in Latin America, Spanish America. However, before we look at the Spanish Empire in the New World, um, let's just pay attention to something very special. Certain years see monumental changes. 1776. Uh, it's not just the uh, founding of the United States, Wealth of Nations, um, the establishment of Adam's famous work, the establishment of, 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 of modern capitalism was also written that same year. Um, Anno Domini, 1492, is one of those years. It's just one of those years. Uh, Lorenzo Medici dies, in many ways, ending the Italian Renaissance. Pope Alexander VI becomes Pope, uh, perhaps the most corrupt Pope of all time, ushering in the Reformation. And 1492, 1492 witnesses something very, very monumental. And it might not be what you're thinking of. It might not be what you're thinking of. Because in in the era during its time, that year, if someone asked, well, in 1493, if you asked the Spaniard, what happened last year? This is what he's going to talk about. This is what he's going to talk about, which brings us to the Spanish conquests. From the 1100s to the 1600s, or at least to 1600, Spain has been in a war. Spain has been in a war. This is often ignored. This is often ignored that by the time the Spanish arrive in the New World, they have been fighting a war for centuries, and they're going to take that war in Spain to the New World. They've been fighting since the 1100s, uh, a war of religion. And by the time of 1492, the Spanish in general are going to view themselves as soldiers of God, soldiers for God. They have a role in the world to spread the Catholic faith. So very quickly, let's just go back to Europe. You thought we were in South America. Now we're back. I apologize. But to understand the Spanish Empire in uh, the New World, we have to go to Spain. It seems only fit. And we have to look at the Reconquista, the Reconquista. To understand the Americans, we have to understand the reconquest, as the Spanish called it, of Spain itself. You see, Spain had been under an occupation. Spanish Christians um, had been under the occupation of Islamic rulers from North Africa. In 711, the year 711, uh, Islamic soldiers from Northern Africa uh, have invaded the Iberian Peninsula, where Portugal and Spain rest, the Christian kings of Spain were not united, and the Islamic forces did a very good job of conquering them. They made it a Muslim territory. Christians living under a minority rule of these Islamic rulers. Al-Andalus was the name that the Muslim conquerors gave to the land of Spain. Well, Beginning in the 1100s, beginning in the 1100s, Christian kings in the north begin to fight the Muslim 
uh, uh, occupiers, um, they get special dispensation from the Pope. At the same time, interestingly enough, that the Christian Knights of Europe are trying to recapture the Holy Land for Christendom, the Pope tells the Spanish nobility, no, you stay in Spain, you reconquer your lands. And so these Christian kings unite against the Muslims, and they begin to fight a hundred years hundreds of years long campaign against um, their Islamic uh, enemies in Spain. These are the Crusades in Spain. The Pope issues special uh, dispensations, um, get out of hell cards, I guess, uh, for Christian knights who fight these so-called heathens. This becomes the objective of every Christian knight, prince, and king at this time, Spain is not united yet. There are different kingdoms within Spain, but we can all focus on the enemy, and the enemy is Islam. They are fighting for Christ in their mind. Conquistador just means conqueror, and that term came about not in the New World, but here during the Reconquista. By 1200, the Muslims have been pushed farther down. You have the kingdoms of Leon, Castile, Aragon, and Navarre fighting against the Muslims. By 1300, by 1300, the last Islamic stronghold of Spain is here far down in the south um, in the uh, Emirate of Granada, that little green spot down there. They're the last holdouts. But the Christian kings are not stopping there. We must defeat this the, these unbelievers, we, we must purify Spain of non-believers. 1492, 1492, that monumental year. Castile and Aragon have already united in a marriage, and they are pushing down on Granada. In 1492, the last emir of Granada, rather than risk his life in battle, hands over his kingdom. He is the last Muslim ruler. He hands it over to Ferdinand and Isabel, the uh, Catholic monarchs, as they were called. By the way, present in this meeting, or at least in Granada, he wasn't at the meeting, was a young Genoan uh, merchant who was going to try to convince the Spanish mar uh, monarchs to lend him three ships. He's got a new route to the east. I wonder how that'll work out. He's got a new route. He's there. He's trying to get a... He's trying to get an audience with um, Ferdinand and Isabella, but their focus is the surrender of Granada. And in 1492, the last ruler of Granada, Islamic ruler, pardon me, um, hands over the keys to the city and leaves. He's allowed to keep his wealth. He's allowed to keep his many concubines and wives, and he leaves. There's an old story that my grandpa told me in his village in Spain. Um, this is his village. Uh, on a clear day, you can see Africa. Africa's right there. That's why it was so easy for the uh, North African uh, Muslims to cross over into Spain and conquer it back in 711. If you want to know, I know it's not important, but my room was right here. This is my grandpa's house. And my room was up here. Pretty cool, right? Anyways, my grandpa told me a story. And if you knew my granddad, he was a brilliant storyteller, but you had to take everything you said with a little bit of salt, maybe maybe more than a pinch. But I want to believe that this story is correct. I don't care if it's not true. I believe it's true. And I've never read that it wasn't true. So we're going to go with it's true. Muhammad the 12th, he's the last ruler. He's handed over the kingdom. He's on his way back to North Africa. He's allowed to live. He's allowed to remain wealthy. But on the road, and this road is near my grandpa's house. He lived in the province of Granada. He's weeping. He's weeping. He's he's lost a kingdom. Could you imagine? I get sad when I lose 20 bucks. I want to cry when I lose 20 bucks. This man's lost a kingdom. And he's weeping in his carriage being pulled along. And his mother is sitting next to him. And she's growing impatient. She's listening to her son cry. Finally, she, finally, she loses her patience. She grabs him by the ear, turns him around, and slaps him in the face. And he holds, she holds onto that ear and she goes, listen, if you had fought like a man, you wouldn't be here now crying like a woman. I was like, ooh, ooh, mama doesn't mess around. I love that story. Again, I don't know if it's true, but for this, we'll believe. 1492 is important to the Spanish, not because of Columbus, but because that's when Spain was finally united under one crown and they have driven 
who they believed were occupiers of their land out. They celebrate these wars every year in Spain. Every village, at least in the east of Spain, will have Moros y Cristian uh, festivals where literally the town dresses up. Half the boys dress up as Christians, half the boys dress up like Muslims, and you walk around and you have fun and you walk uh, in, in, in processions and you dance during the fiesta. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant. Now, the people that are celebrating don't really think about it, but that's how tied into Spanish identity this reconquista is this is uh, a fourth of july uh, 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 a 14th of july if you are french this is when spain became spain when they drove the unbeliever out of their lands the other half of the village as i said dress like muslims it is super fun if you're a good kid you go to church and you thank god that that he helped the spanish do so but for many of us it was just an excuse to drink and dance. Moros y Cristians, it is a, a celebration of celebrations and key to Spanish identity. In the nicer towns, they even put on naval wars, which is pretty rad. The first thing that the Spanish do is they pass the Alhambra decree. This expels all Jews, later Muslims, um, who refuse to convert. You see, they want to purify. They want to purify Spain. The Spanish crown, with permission from the Pope, issue the Alhambra decree. Either convert now or leave immediately. There are hundreds of thousands of Jews in Spain. Many convert, most leave, and a great number secretly remain Jews. They say, yeah, I convert. But behind the scenes, they still keep kosher. They still light the candles on Friday nights, etc. We have to root those people out. This is a map showing the uh, 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 expulsion of Spanish Jews. Portugal will do the same thing, by the way, with their Jews in the 1400s as well. In order to purify, in order to purify their kingdom, the Spanish monarchs, with permission of the Pope, um, institute the Inquisition. And we are rooting out secret Jews, uh, secret Muslims. This is the Inquisition. This is what Napoleon shut down. We want to purify our kingdom. If we are the most Catholic of kingdoms, and this is what the Spanish called themselves, then we must be pure. Are we not soldiers of God? Did we not just fight for centuries for a Christian victory over the heathens, as they were called? There is a tradition in Spain. When you meet with someone, you go to their home, they will give you a beautiful piece of pork, usually serrano ham, but there's different kinds. They're not aware of this. They're not aware of this. But this goes back to during that time, during the Inquisition, when you wanted to make sure that your friend, your visitor, your business associate was a true Catholic and not a secret Jew. And so you'd give them a piece of pork. And if you don't know this, Jews are prohibited by religious law from eating pork. You just can't. You can't do it. And so Rodrigo, eat some pork. No, I'm good. Rodrigo eat some pork. No, I just ate. It's funny. I just, I just ate right on my way here. I, Rodrigo, eat the pork. Oh, this is how you know who you're dealing with. Again, that tradition dates back to then. It's no longer even, people don't even think about it. Most Spaniards don't even know about this, but this is what uh, 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 life was like for those secret crypto Jews, as they were called. The effects of the reconquista and the reunification of the most Catholic of kingdoms, Spain, it becomes a model. The reconquest of Spain becomes a model for the Spanish. Conquest in the name of God. The Spanish become convinced, convinced that God is on their side. Now, always be nervous and suspicious when kingdoms, nations, individuals are certain that God is on their side. I'm not saying they're not, but
but be careful, be careful. And in 1492, Spain is entirely certain that God is on their side. Please keep that in mind. As we move now to the new world, not new to the people that inhabited it, but to the Europeans, certainly. Now, there are literally thousands, tens of thousands of tribes in the Americas um, in 1492, um, each with their own distinct language, culture, uh, religious uh, 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 interpretations. I'm not, I can't look at all of them by any means. And I'm staying with Mexico down because that is what becomes New Spain. So if you want to uh, uh, know above, this is not going to be it. And there's no great detail here. I'm just trying to paint a picture. This is modern history. So we're not going back back. But one of the empires, and this was very much an empire that these conquistadors are going to come into contact with, are, are the Aztecs. They built their capital. They were promised a land by their god um, in a swamp on an island, and they would develop this into a highly, highly civilized capital. When the Spanish finally do arrive, by the way, they are marvel. They marvel. No city like this exists in Europe. It's giant. It's clean. Uh, the Aztec develop a strict hierarchy, by the way. You have a royal line. You have an aristocracy. You have a clergy. You have a peasantry. You have a merchant class. And yes, you have slaves. This is just as civilized as anything that you'll find in the New World at this time. Very different but incredibly civilized with an alphabet, et cetera, highly uh, advanced mathematics. This is a warrior society, much like Europe at the time. It's exactly the same as Europe at the time. If you want to get a name for yourself, if you want to rise through the ranks, you show extra bravery in war. And the Aztecs were noted warriors. They defeated many, many of their neighbors and subjugated them made them clients. You have to pay tribute, whether it be in, 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 in food, sacrificial slaves, etc. Highly martial society, very warlike, incredibly advanced, very religious, devoutly religious, which leads us to uh, sacrifice. Yes, they did. They certainly sacrificed hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands. This was in the name of religion. I'm not justifying anything. I don't pick sides in history, but just know, according to them, the sun will not rise if we don't do this. I don't want to do this. I have to do this. We have to keep the gods happy. Men, women, children were sacrificed by the Aztecs, certainly, 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 which is going to get them a lot of enemies, just so you know. Please keep that in mind. So when the Spanish do arrive, many of their neighbors are like, oh, you want to help? I'll help because they don't want to live under the Aztecs. Incredibly advanced. Incredibly stratified. Again, just like Europe, you're born into your class. You don't jump from classes uh, in Aztec society. Next, let's look very briefly at the Inca, stretching all along the western coast of modern South America, high in the Andes, Way up in the mountains were the Incas. Now, they have many, many cities. This is a highly civilized society. Uh, the one that is, have been, has been left for us, only discovered, what, 100 years ago, Machu Picchu, gives us an idea of what it was like to live within one of these Inca cities. This is what it would have looked like as recreated by an artist. Now, the Inca are noted for their incredible building abilities. Building this on top of a mountain, which is literally on the top of the world, is incredible enough. No mortar. Those rocks are cut to size. 12 corners, 12 points. And in many places, you can't put a piece of paper in between those stones. It's so well cut. The Inca, like the Aztec, were great conquerors, subjugating many, many of their neighbors. And they have something that the Aztecs have, and that is gold. That is gold and silver, and the Spanish are going to fall in love. Some might call it a blind, unhealthy love with gold and silver. The Maya also, not the Maya, pardon me, the Inca, not all, but many uh, practiced um, skull modification. Yes, indeed, these are real skulls. 
Imagine what the Spanish thought when they saw these individuals. You start at birth and you slowly, and they're not, they weren't the only ones. It's done in other parts of the world. Um, and some North American uh, natives did the same thing. And you slowly press it, press it, and press it until finally you have that elongated head. Finally, let's look at the Mayan people. The Mayan people um, here on the Yucatan Peninsula, modern day uh, southern Mexico, Guatemala, etc. Um, deep in the jungles, deep in the jungles of the Yucatan uh, were the Maya. Now, the Maya are long since gone. The civilization, pardon me, the Maya are there. Their language, the people are there. But the Maya civilization uh, that built these giant temples has collapsed. It collapses 900s um, uh, uh, CE, uh, 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 AD. CE, same thing. Um, but this was a highly civilized society. Again, it's collapsed by the time the Spanish get there, but the people are still there. Millions of Mayans are still living in this region. The Mayans were very literate. Books, alphabets, extreme uh, advanced mathematics, etc., There are a few Mayan books left. Most were destroyed by the Spanish. Their own form of hieroglyphics. In the late 1400s and early 1500s, strange ships are seen off of the coast of Mexico, the Caribbean, South America. These ships are the Spanish. These ships are the Spanish. And this is going to represent an apocalypse, an apocalypse for these native people. Their entire way of life is going to change. Those who are lucky enough to survive because many are going to die. 90%, 90% of the natives of Mexico and Latin America, South America, are going to go away with the arrival of the Spanish. And it all really begins with that Genoan sailor who was trying to get an audience with uh, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. In the end, they do give him uh, uh, three ships. Like... Napoleon's wife, recent years have not been kind to Columbus. Uh, he was once celebrated as a hero. Now he's very much defamed as a villain. Please keep in mind, you can be both. You can be heroic. You can be brave. And I think sailing into the night, not knowing if you're ever going to make it back is pretty brave. But Columbus was particularly greedy and brutal as well. Please keep that in mind. Just like Napoleon's wife, this statue has lost its head. Three ships. Three ships. Give it a shot. Give it a shot. Go for it. Well, he sails, and he sails, and he sails. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So finally he sees birds. Wait a minute. Birds? That means land is near. He finds land. You guys know I didn't give anything away. Um, but what he doesn't find is what he was looking for, spices. He's convinced he's found a route to the East Indies. He calls the natives Indians. It sticks. Even till this dying day, he refuses to acknowledge that he's discovered a new world. No, I discovered a new route to the Indies. They don't find spices, but they find something else that's even better. Gold. Gold. A lot of it. And even more silver. Forget spices, man. I can buy spices. I want gold and silver. And so the Spanish fall in love. They become consumed with finding and securing gold and silver for Spain. Because if you do it for Spain, you're doing it for God, right? It's the most Catholic of kingdoms. Timeline of Spanish conquests in the 1500s. The Spanish very quickly conquer entire tracts of land entire empires fall to just a few hundred spaniards these spaniards shock and all the natives 
they come with giant tree trunks that shoot fire, knocking down mountains. They wear suits of the hardest metal you could imagine. The Indians can't believe it. They can't believe it. They have giant blades of that same strong metal that cut through big, big trees, arms, legs, it doesn't matter. They have sticks that shoot. They spit fire and with stones tear your flesh apart. This is what they wrote. Terrified them. What really terrifies them are the horses. There's no horses native to the New World. Remember, this is the first time. At first, they thought they were really tall, four-legged men. Those are the first reports. They marvel at these creatures. They're terrified of them. One creature that really scares the living hell out of the natives in the early years were the dogs that the Spanish brought, giant wolfhounds. These things are giant, and they are terrifying, and they are very, very... Uh, 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 uh. they're trained to kill put it that way these things are giant absolutely terrifying the natives look at that my god now granted she's probably really short but still you get the idea of the size of these beasts they don't have any giant dogs so these things are brand new to the natives the conquistadors arrive the conquistadors arrive who were the conquistadors well these were usually second third, fourth sons of nobles. Say your dad is a minor noble in Spain. He has a little domain. You're not getting that. Your eldest brother is getting that. You get nothing. So you have to go out and make it on your own. You can become a priest or you can take a chance. You can take a chance and die a rich man. You go to the equivalent of Mars. And if you're lucky, you can have your own estate, a bigger estate. That'll show your brother. That'll show your father. The conquistadors were brutal, brave, cruel, heroic, and demonic. All of those things can be true. Don't pick sides in history. They venture off. They venture off. They have two objectives, these conquistadors. They want gold and they want land. And they're going to find a lot of it. They're going to find a lot of it in the new world. Mexico City Falls. Well, Mexico City is the name that the Spanish give to the uh, 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 Aztec capital. When the Spanish arrive in Mexico, the Aztec population was between five and six million people. In 1521, Hernan Cortes, with a few hundred conquistadors, aided by tens of thousands of other Indian tribes, uh, finally conquer the Aztec empire in 1535 the vice royalty of new spain was established by the king of spain this is begin this is going to begin a 300 year domination of the spanish of mexico next to fall were the inca next to fall were the inca of south america their empire spread to almost 700,000 square miles, 700,000 square miles. In with about three to eight million Incas, three to eight million Incans, um, as many as 16 million subjects of the empire, as many as 16 million subjects of the empire. Remember, they're conquering their neighbors. Anyways, in 1528, Francisco Pizarro and 168 men enter the empire. 1532, they capture and imprison the emperor of the Inca. Thus begins their domination of the Incan lands. In 1542, the vice royalty of Peru was established. Please know, however, that over the 1500s, there are pockets of resistance throughout the Incan territory. Next to fall were the Maya. Next to fall were the Maya. About 5 to 10 million people uh, were the Maya. Again, there'll be pockets of resistance among the Mayan people uh, well into the 1600s. But for the most part, they've been subjugated um, by the middle 1500s. One after another, the Spanish are conquering. How do just a few hundred men conquer empires? Yes, they had help. Yes, they had guns. Yes, they had swords, horses, etc. 
I was going to say secret weapon, but it wasn't a secret. It was very obvious. Um, what really destroyed those empires was plague. Things that would give Europeans a fever, a headache, sore muscles, wipe out millions. Millions. Smallpox, measles, the mumps. The natives had no natural immunities to them. And so when they are affected or infected, they die. They die. Let me give you an account. Let's read an Aztec account very quickly of when smallpox entered their capital as they warred against the Spanish in 1520. The Aztec wrote, quote, a great plague broke out in the capital. It lasted for 70 days, striking everywhere in the city and killed vast numbers of people. Sores erupted on our faces, our breasts, our bellies. Those are the sores. Those are the sores. A Spanish priest also left a description of, of, of the smallpox epidemic among the Aztec. And this is going to be repeated time and time again throughout uh, 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 Central and Latin uh, South America. The priest wrote of this epidemic. As the Indians did not know the remedy of the disease, they died in heaps. They died in heaps, like bedbugs. In many places, it happened that everyone in a house died. And as it was impossible to bury the great number of dead, they pulled the houses down over them so that their houses became their tombs. This will be repeated over and over. 90% will die most the vast majority from plague the effects within 100 years within 100 years 90 percent of the population of mexico the caribbean wiped out wiped out the other side effect is that the spanish have conquered a giant empire for themselves and they are going to become incredibly incredibly wealthy Please note that unlike the English, these lands are going to be very, very wealthy with gold and silver. The English are not going to have that when they settle the colonies up north. And so the English are going to establish their colonies in a very different way than the Spanish. The Spanish are going to have direct rule. The king rules this land. They're going to limit immigration. The immigrants that are allowed to come to this new land are not allowed to bring their wives, unlike the English. And so there's going to be blending. They're not allowed, for the most part, uh, uh, property rights. Self-rule, no. The English grant each colony their own parliament, just like they do in England. And so the English colonies are going to evolve very differently than the Spanish colonies. All this new land. This is all they know of the world at this time. But look at all that land. All that land is there for the taking and the Spanish take. They take. By 1550, their empire runs from northern, well, actually southern Texas, all the way down to almost the foot of South America, across the Caribbean, even parts of Florida. Uh, they also, because they are Habsburgs, own many pockets of Europe as well. Very, very wealthy. Into the 1600s, their empire is going to grow and grow and grow the Spanish are going to become very, very wealthy. What about the role of religion in Spanish America? Well, religion in South America is going to reflect the two wants of Spain at this time. What does Spain hope to get out of the new world? Gold and souls. We want gold, and they're going to pull a lot out of this land. But we also want more souls for God. We want these natives to be converted. Gold and souls. In that order, honestly, for the longest time, gold was much more important than souls. Who dominates? Who dominates New Spain? Who are at the top of the food chain in New Spain? That's what we're calling the Spanish Empire in the New World. The nobility on the left the nobility on the left, and the clergy. Forget everything I just told you about what happened in France or even what happened in Britain. Spain is going to remain old school. 
Spain is going to remain very traditional. Spain is going to remain feudal well into the 1700s. Please know that. If you are a peasant, you are not heard. Two institutions rule New Spain, the nobility in service of the king and the clergy in service of the king, quite frankly, and the Pope in Rome. Background, background. Remember, 1492, 1492, the end of many centuries of fighting. It was Isabella of Castile, known as the Catholic monarch, and Ferdinand II of Aragon, who marry in 1469, uniting Spain, uniting these two kingdoms. Now, they're second cousins, but they ask for a special dispensation from the Pope. The Pope says, of course, do it. And so they marry, uniting the crown of Castile and the crown of Aragon. When they finally, when they finally kick out the last emir of Granada, um, they introduce the Inquisition to root out non-believers. It was Catherine with the Pope who brings in the Inquisition. We want to root out all non-believers, do we not? Well, we're going to take that attitude to the new world. We're going to take that idea of, 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 of absolute purity to the new world. All of those souls, all of those souls, my God, if God was already on our side, how much more will he be on our side when we give over to him millions? It was always part of the deal. The conquistadors came in the name of God. And following them were priests, always one and the same. With the sword and the banner of Christ, they conquered. It was always the two golden souls. Pope Alexander VI and Julius II both gave the Spanish crown absolute authority over the church in the New World. Unheard of. Unheard of. But they gave the crown complete dominion over the conversion of natives in the new world it's your guys's job you do it we trust you and by the way as a special thank you to the catholic church they were awarded giant tracts of land in the new world the clergy become giant landowners in the new world conversion of new spain the conversion of New Spain, very early on, very early on, priests go into Mexico and other parts of New Spain. They learn the local languages. They learn the local religion. They um, become very adept, very knowledgeable of these natives. They want to convert them. They do. That is a sincere wish. Um, and they do, in many parts of Mexico, convert these Native Americans. Now, interestingly enough, Interestingly enough, what they do, they don't view these natives as heathens the same way they do, say, Jews and Muslims, because Jews and Muslims knew about Christ and rejected him. These guys don't know about him. And so their native religion was more tolerable than, say, a secret Jew or a secret Muslim. But the Catholic Church does something very clever. And they did this, by the way, way back when they converted Europeans to Catholicism. Remember, Christianity begins in, in, in Israel. It's a new religion. They're trying to convert people. Well, the natives of Europe um, had many gods and nature worship. They do with the Mexican Indians what they did a thousand years earlier with the native Europeans. What you do is you look for similarities with your gods and my gods, and you try to bring some kind of union. And what they did is they would tear down the idols, certainly. You can't have idol worship. That's ridiculous. They tore those idols down. No, 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 no. You can't have that. But also they looked for parallels. Oh, you have a moon goddess who is the giver of, of, of life? A moon goddess. Okay. All right. Well, we have a, a mother in our faith. We have a mother in our faith. So what do we do? We put moons and stars on the Virgin Mary. You see? This is, this is the Mary that you see in Mexico. We put stars and a moon on it. We knock down the temple that was dedicated to the moon goddess and we build a cathedral. But it's dedicated 
to the Virgin Guadalupe. You see, with the moon and the stars. We build it right on the same spot. Genius. Genius. Oh, so you used to sacrifice people to the gods to make the gods happy. Well, no, that's not unreasonable. You can't do that anymore. But our God sacrificed himself. What? Himself for all of us. You see, I'm drawing a parallel. This is what they did. Your priests would eat the flesh of those sacrificed. Well, you can't do that anymore. But when you take the Eucharist, when you put it in his mouth, your mouth, you are eating the flesh of Christ. That's his sacrifice to you. Do you see the parallel? You see how genius that is? I think it's quite brilliant. Festivals that weren't anti-Christian were allowed to stay. Traditions that weren't anti, as long as it didn't go against the Bible, it can stay. There's nowhere in the Bible that speaks of the day of the dead. This is left over from the old, the old religion, the old faith. But in Mexico today, you'll see the Virgin Mary with the baby Jesus at the day of the dead. That is a perfect blending of native tradition, native religion, and Roman Catholicism. This is how the Catholic Church succeeds so well in so many parts of the New World. In Mexico, the Spanish also sought to purify. They sought to purify. Now, formally, the Inquisition isn't established until 1571. But long before that, people were killed for refusing to convert to the new faith especially the Maya. The Maya were particularly resistant, and the Spanish had no problem in killing those who reject the word of God. They also burned most of the books of the Mayans. If we can kill their history, if we can kill their mythology, then they'll come to us. If we leave them with nothing, they have to come to us. And this is what was carried out by the Spanish authorities and the Roman Catholic Church in places like Mexico. This is the place where people burned. This is the place where people burned. The Inquisition came to Mexico with the Spanish. We are trying to root out all non-believers. We are trying to cleanse all non-believers. Let me just give you some statistics here because I didn't earlier, and I want you to know this. In 1580, there were 1,500 members of the clergy in Mexico. 1580, about 1,500. By 1650, there are 3,000, 3,000, many of whom are part of this inquisition. We want, we want the Catholic faith to bring three things to Mexico and the rest of New Spain. Number one, we want salvation for the natives. We, we are interested in saving your souls. Number two, we want to destroy the old social order. We want to destroy your old social order the way you did things. And then finally, we want to maintain stability with our new social order. Spreading the faith is a way of doing that. And it's not just Mexico, please, please know. The auto de fe, um, as it was known, the Inquisition was used throughout Spanish America. One target of the Inquisition were crypto Jews, secret Jews, secret Jews, uh, just like in Spain. When the Spanish uh, begin arriving in the New World, many secret Jews, crypto Jews, arrive as well. Um, between 1571 and 1700, between 1571 and 1700, 324 people were prosecuted for being secret Jews. 324 were prosecuted for being secret Jews by the Inquisition. Uh, 29 of them were put to death. 29 of them were put to death. They would look in your window on a Friday night to make sure you weren't lighting Shabbat candles. Just to make sure. Is this man lighting candles for Sabbath? You better close your shades. Another target of the Inquisition were homosexuals. Just like in Europe, the Inquisition targeted homosexuals. In 1658, 
1658, 123 people were arrested on the mere suspicion of homosexual activity. Um, 14 of them, 14 of them were put to death for uh, being accused of being homosexual. The Catholic Church did a remarkable job for the record. The most Catholic place in the world is Latin America. Um, certainly, you will not find a more faithful people, quite frankly, than in many pockets of South and Central America. In 1910, in 1910, 65%, 65%, the majority of Catholics were found in Europe. By 2010, Latin America holds the largest pocket. Brazil today has the highest number of Catholics of any country in the world, 123 million, 123 million. In Europe, it's just the, 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 the most populated uh, 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 Catholic country is Italy with uh, uh, approximately uh, 37 million practicing Catholics. This is a map of Roman Catholicism outside of what portugal ireland and poland europe is much less catholic than it used to be 87 percent of latin america is catholic europe only 38 percent catholic although in recent years those numbers are dropping in latin america uh one, many young people are no longer religious, but also Protestant denominations have done really, really uh, good jobs of converting um, uh, uh, Latin Americans to different Protestant denominations. The economy, government, the economy and government of Spanish America. What do we want to do with this new land? We want to organize these recently conquered people, certainly into a system that works and we also want to make spain very wealthy by exploiting the natural resources and the spanish will do both the spanish will practice mercantilism mercantilism or mercantilism is a system where everything is traded and produced within the empire we don't this isn't free trade it's directed by the crown all trade occurs within the empire and it is directed by the crown spain makes a fortune because it can under this mercantile system we get the gold we take it to spain we send from spain back to the new world any manufactured goods finished goods etc this is a golden uh, 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 highway back and forth back and forth um, the economy is completely controlled by the government absolutely controlled and it's all based on maintaining the wealth of the empire now spain dominates the caribbean even by 1700 ships leave daily back and forth taking gold from the new world to spain well if you guys know anything about human nature, there's going to be people there that want to take it. And various buccaneers prey on those Spanish ships, uh, mostly English, but there were certainly uh, French pirates, uh, 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 Dutch pirates, German pirates. But this will be the scourge of the Spanish. To this day, to call someone a pirate in Spain is fighting talk. Whereas in England, most of these pirates were English. It's a compliment. It's like calling someone a cowboy in this country. Man, you're a real pirate. That just means that you take chances, that you're unapologetic. In Spain, that's fight and talk. There were women pirates. There were a great many black pirates. Um, tremendous diversity. And they elect, usually elected their captain. Tremendous democracy. Now, these were raping, pillaging lunatics. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to rewrite history. Uh, but a very interesting time in world history. By the 1800s, when they go away, we begin romanticizing them. Uh, they do the same thing in the United States. By the time they subjugate the Native Americans onto reservations, that's when they start romanticizing them. When they were a real threat, they were demonized. But once they kind of go away, we go, oh, those are the days of high adventure. 
One way in which the Spanish attempt to organize and make a profit was the encomienda system. The encomienda system, how does it work? Well, this is practiced in the early years of the empire. The Spanish crown would grant a Spaniard a set number of natives to work, usually about 100. You were given 100 natives to work. And you could either work directly for your uh, Spanish lord or pay him tribute every year or every month. I demand this amount of uh, gold, silver, etc. This is an encomienda system. Think of it as a giant plantation with natives working the land. In return, these Spanish nobles were supposed to offer the natives protection and conversion. That was what was expected of you from this title. What usually resulted was nothing short of slavery. Nothing short of slavery. These Spanish lords on these encomiendas were incredibly brutal. You better bring me my gold. You had better bring me my silver. Um, and they could be absolutely brutish. Absolutely brutish. What does the crown get out of this system? One fifth of all the profits. One fifth of all the profits. In 1574, the Viceroy of Peru, Diego Lopez de Velasco, concluded there were about 32,000 Spanish families in the New World. About 4,000 of them controlled encomiendas. 1.5 million natives paid tribute by 1574, and up to 5 million lived under this system of some sort it won't be until the 1720s that this system is abolished by the spanish authorities this is brutal brutal work this is slavery this is slavery um, it's hard to really get an idea of what life was like um under the spanish for the natives with these old drawings so let's take a quick trip just a very quick trip you have to know that slavery is still with us uh, parts of Africa, Asia, slavery is still very much a thing. And right now, as I speak, there are men, women, and children slaving away in mines. Um, and this is what life was like for the natives. Children torn from their parents, no education. Um, if you are hungry, tough work. If you are sick, tough work. This was the life of the natives of New Spain. Um, it exists today. It's just, I think, easier to see real faces when we're describing these things. So many people think that slavery is a thing of the past. No, no. There are more slaves now than there were uh, back in the middle 1800s, only because the population has gotten so much bigger. There's debt slavery. There's outright slavery. There's a tremendous different forms. Economic slavery is, 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 is different, but arguably very, very the same. All of us own something that was made by a slave right now in your house somewhere. Tennis shoes, cell phones, something. I promise you, that's the truth. We should know that. I'm not saying give up everything, but just keep that in mind, especially when you judge generations of the past because they put it out of their mind as well. It's easy to do. What were the effects of this system, of this conquest between 1500 and 1650? Between 1500 and 1650, Spain extracted, took out of the earth, 181 tons of gold. A ton is 2,000 pounds. 181 tons of gold and 16,000 tons of silver. Pulled it out of the new world and brought it back to Spain. Between 1500 and 1800, the new world supplied at least 75% of the world's total output of gold and silver. Between 1500 and 1800, 75% of the gold and silver being pulled out of the earth came from the New World. What were the effects on Spain? Well, Spain is made incredibly wealthy. At least a small minority of the aristocracy, the nobility, is made incredibly wealthy. Most Spanish peasants remain quite poor. And this is a side effect. Spain doesn't need to modernize. Spain doesn't need to experiment with uh, stock exchanges, charter companies, new banking systems, like the British have to, like the Dutch have to. 
The Inquisition stopped free thought in Spain. So the greatest minds of science go up north. Gold is going to block growth in economics, so much so that by the 1800s, Spain is poor. Because I always like to think of Spain as a really rich kid. Think about it. If you never had to work and your dad and mom always just gave you money, bam, 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 bam. And then you hit 30 and suddenly the gold and silver runs out. You've never grown and developed as a person. That's what happens to Spain. She was a, a rich kid who got cut off and was quite lost. We're going to look at that later, but this is what happens to Spain. We know much of the Spanish treatment of the natives because of a priest named Las Casas. Bartholomew de Las Casas was a Dominican friar, historian, and social reformer. In 1502, he came to the New World with the goal of converting Indians in the New World. Um, however, he becomes increasingly disgusted at their treatment. In 1515, he gives up his own plantation his own native slaves, and begins documenting the atrocities that he was witnessing. He argued, how can we convert these natives if all we bring them is misery and pain? We can't keep enslaving these natives because that's what it was. And he documents it. He documents the Spanish treatment of the natives. And it's published. It is published. He writes how hands and Noses are removed if you don't pay your right tribute, if you don't bring me my set mount of gold and silver. He writes how children are torn from uh, the arms of the mother because the mother has to go back out and work. These terrible, terrible descriptions are spread throughout Europe. By the way, it's used by uh, Spain's enemies to try to show how cruel the Spanish are. The English tell their citizens, if the, Spain, if the Spanish invade England, you see what they did to the Indians? They'll, it'll be worse for us. So this is good propaganda as well. But Las Casas wants to bring Christ to the Indians. And, and we can't have this as long as they're being so brutally treated. In 1542, Spain implemented laws to help the natives. They're known as the new laws. It limits the powers of the encomienda owners. It limits their powers and grants certain protections to natives. Las Casas himself was appointed protector of the Indians. Protector of the Indians. That post, by the way, is going to remain until 1812. Las Casas will make a very regretful recommendation. He will make a very regretful recommendation. Not wanting to have Native Americans as slaves, he wrote a letter to the king of Spain, Charles V. He advocated importing black slaves from Africa. The Portuguese are already doing this on islands in the Atlantic to relieve the suffering of the natives. Well, Spain is going to take his advice. Spain is going to take his advice. Um, it's a recommendation less, that Las Casas will always regret. I soon repented and judged myself guilty of ignorance. I came to realize that black slavery was as unjust as Indian slavery, and I was not sure that my ignorance and good faith would secure me in the eyes of my God. He very quickly becomes a critic of African slavery in New Spain. Very quickly, very, very quickly, he becomes an advocate of no slavery period. It's too late. And for the record, it, it would have happened anyways. It would have happened anyways. Uh, the Portuguese were already doing it in islands in the Atlantic. Um, but it's a recommendation that he will forever regret. Slavery in New Spain. No, I mean African slavery, because we already had slavery with the natives. Spain was the first to use African slaves in the New World. Um, it begins It begins uh, on the island of Hispanola. It moves to Cuba, Mexico, etc. Uh, the Portuguese first started using African slaves. For the record, 
Muslims have been using African slaves for many, many, many centuries, millions, long before Europeans did it. There was a very healthy slave trade in Africa already, buying them from warring tribes. They were used to, like the natives, mine precious metals, um, work in the fields. They were perfect. The trade winds allowed for slave ships to go around the Atlantic. The, the, the trade winds were perfect. Um, they were not as uh, vulnerable to tropical diseases, having come from the tropics themselves. But most importantly, their black skin made them an other. If you ran away, you still had that skin. You couldn't hide among the natives. You couldn't hide among the Spanish. It was a perfect storm. Um, the Spanish will lead the way, in fact. Approximately 17.5% of the African slaves, the between 9 and 12 million slaves that will eventually come to the New World, 17.5% um, will be brought by the Spanish. However, the British and the Portuguese will exceed those numbers. Not often spoken about is the history of uh, black slavery in Mexico, Central America, Latin America. Certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, you can see it today when you go to Mexico. You can see it today in parts of Mexico. Certainly, these are the descendants of those African slaves. The Hacienda system. Outside of the mines and the Ecomiendas, the Hacienda system is another way to make a profit. What is the Hacienda system? Well, we give away giant tracts of land, vast tracts of land to Spanish noble families, usually. Um, and they employ all the local Indians on the hacienda. However, the local Indians um, get paid uh, next to nothing, usually nothing. Just you can live on land that used to be yours, but now it's mine. Um, and anything that you have to purchase, uh, you purchase from me. And you have obligations. You have obligations to your feudal lord. This is feudalism in the new world. The Spanish bring feudalism to the new world. Western Europe, they're getting rid of it, at least in Britain. Um, no, the Spanish are importing it to the new world. You can see these giant haciendas in pockets of Spain today. These are leftovers. The noble would live in this estate, and the uh, Indian peasants would work land that's not their own for their lord. Spanish nobility granted fast tracks. You might even be given a title, just like back in Spain. These are the rulers of New Spain. You have the uh, white Spanish, the natives, and at the bottom, uh, the black slaves. The effects. Well, what you have is a tiny minority ruling over a majority. Simple as that. A small white Spanish elite ruling over a majority native population, along with the clergy. The government, this is direct rule. This is not the English colonies. The English colonies gave each colony their own parliament. This is direct rule. The king appoints the viceroy. There are four vice royalties in the New World. Uh, New Spain, Peru, New Granada, and uh, Rio de la Plata. We have divided it all up. The king appoints the governor, and the governors rule absolutely over their subjects. Very different than Anglo-America. Men like this, the first Marquis of Sonora. These are the elites of Mexico. Immigration, immigration. Over the 1500s, 240,000 Spaniards immigrated into America. 240,000 Spaniards. In the 1600s, another half a million come, mostly to Mexico. Again, unlike England, unlike England, Spain limits immigration. They don't want a bunch of people there because they want to control the gold, the silver, the uh, hacienda, the ecomienda system. In England, they're throwing people. They're putting people on ships, whether they like it or not, and they're sending them to the New World. Spain's very different. Mostly just single men come. And so we're, we're going to see a tremendous blending 
the urge to merge uh, 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 will occur in New Spain. We're going to look at all of those things in our next lesson. Thank you all very, very, very much until we meet again.